Perhaps the most harrowing and disturbing episodes of British colonial history, today we talk about the Black Hole of Calcutta. In the summer of 1756, after the Nawab of Bengal, Siraj Audwala, stormed and captured Fort William, 146 British prisoners were thrown into a suffocatingly small dungeon measuring a mere 18 by 14 feet. Over the course of a torturous night, cramped in unbearable heat and gasping for breath in a pitch-black cell, the prisoners were driven to the brink of madness. By dawn, the ordeal had claimed 123 lives. Only 23 emerged alive, with their spirits shattered by a night of horror. The tragedy quickly became a byword for the brutalities of colonial rule, igniting a wave of indignation across Britain and bolstering the East India Company's resolve for more stringent military campaigns. Thus the Black Hole of Calcutta, while mired in a great deal of historical controversy over its exact details which we will get to, it remains a darkly iconic symbol of a uniquely dark time, and a warning of what can happen when the tables are turned. Hello and welcome everyone. Bit of a grim one today. I've always wanted to talk about it. I've not talked about it yet, so here we are. Now, as always, best way to support the channel, like and subscribe, tell your friends, you know what it's all about. I don't need to remind you. So let's all get nice and comfortable. And we can go back to the mid-18th century, when we find ourselves in those golden days of colonialism, where the sun never set on the British Empire. So, at this time, the mid-18th century, India was complicated, to say the least, multifaceted and fragmented. Now, despite the Mughal Empire retaining nominal authority, it had been in this state of progressive decline, with numerous regions governed by independent or semi-independent princely states. These European powers who had just shown up to stake their own claims, especially the British and the French, were fervently extending their influence, competing for dominance over the subcontinent's trade routes and resources. Now, on to the British East India Company. Along with the French East India Company, where well, they had established significant trading posts along the coasts of India. Of course, it's a pretty good halfway point when you're trading with other places. Now, Bengal emerged as a particularly vital region. Why is this? Well, it was mainly due to its abundant resources and prosperous textile industry. Which brings us to Calcutta, which is now not rendered in the spelling which is presented in the thumbnail and title, but now rendered rather with a K instead of C, and pronounced Kolkata, I believe. Well, that was the capital of the Bengal Presidency, and, of course, a pivotal settlement of the British East India Company, functioning as both a commercial centre and a strategic defensive outpost. Now a quick little word on the East India Company. Think of it as a giant company that grew into a giant corporation that grew into effectively a governing body of its own. The first one that was really too big to fail conducted its own diplomacy effectively a government unto itself. Of course, that was one of the reasons why they had to pull the reins on it later on, but this is not really about the British East India Company, it's more about the black hole and the events in Calcutta especially. 
I'll do a full video on the East India Company later on, but think of it as just a giant evil corporation, if you want to boil it down to those base terms. Now, the East India Company constructed Fort William in Calcutta to safeguard its valuable assets and conduct all of its business in a secure manner, and probably a secretive one too. Nevertheless, the political environment was laden with tension. The newly appointed ruler of Bengal, the Nawab Siraj, Ad, Siraj Ud Daula, rather, was a youthful but ambitious leader, intent on establishing his dominance and diminishing the increasing power of the European companies that were encroaching in on his domain. He'd grown progressively weary of both British and French, and he perceived all these actions as a menace to his sovereignty. One can hardly blame him. It's hard to describe it as anything else. Hmm? Well, in the context of the global conflict term, the Seven Years' War, the British and the French were having quite a hard time getting along, which is really not like them. Well, in 1756, apprehensive that conflicts could extend to India and therefore threaten trade and money, the British East India Company commenced a strengthening of the defences at Fort William without obtaining the consent of the Nawab. Now, this is a very big problem. When you're a guest in somebody's house, you don't start rearranging the furniture. Of course, it was seen as a provocation. Now, Daula perceived this action as a blatant challenge to his authority. So, he insisted that both the British and the French halt the fortification of their positions in Bengal. Although the French had acquiesced quite wisely, the British did not. They exhibited reluctance and their apparent insubordination exacerbated the Nawab's ire. Well, exacerbated by the British apathy towards his demands, Siraj assembled his forces and advanced towards Calcutta, resolute in his intent to subjugate the company. As his forces neared, the British garrison at Fort William, led by the inept officials of the East India Company, commenced a panic. Governor Drake, the British commander, absconded with numerous other officers, rendering the fort inadequately staffed and susceptible in a final effort to maintain control. The remaining soldiers were placed under the command of John Zephaniah Holwell. We'll get to him in a moment a senior official of the East India Company and former military surgeon, who had led a small contingent of defenders, including several Anglo-Indian soldiers and civilians, seeking refuge within the fort. Well, notwithstanding their endeavours, the British defence completely disintegrated. The defection of multiple Indian sepoys further undermined their already tenuous position, on June the 20th, 1756, the forces of Siraj Ad Ud, rather, excuse me, Daula captured Fort William. The detained British officers, soldiers, and civilians were subsequently confined into the poorly ventilated dungeon that would gain notoriety as the video's namesake. Well, Holwell actually left us with a great account of this, which we'll get to in a moment. But before we do, we'll just go on about the general feel before the fort's collapse and after. Now, of course, the British were not really used to losing battles in colonial territories. When you're on a winning streak, there's quite a bit of confidence that goes into it. And of course, the more you win the more confident you are with the trend. Well, following the fort's capture, Holwell sought an audience 
with the Nawab, who initially reassured him of the prisoner's safety, stating that on the word of a, of a soldier, no harm will befall them. Well, that's not a bad deal, isn't it? However, harm befell them. Despite all the reassurances, as night fell on June the 20th, 1756, the situation deteriorated. The Bengali jailers, unable to find a suitable location to detain the prisoners, decided to confine them in that small little dungeon, already known as the Black Hole, the space measuring by 14 by 18 feet, is about 4 metres by 5.5 metres. Holwell and the other prisoners were disrobed and shoved into the cramped little cell, along with dozens of soldiers and even civilians. On the following morning, when the dungeon was finally opened around 6 a.m., only about 23 of them remained alive, having endured extreme heat and suffocation throughout the night, no doubt quite a bit of panic. The exact number of prisoners who entered the black hole and the casualties from the incident remain debated, and we'll get to the debate from the Indian side later on in the video. Now, Stanley Walpert estimated that 64 of them were actually imprisoned, and 21 of them survived whereas D.L. Pryor suggests that around 43 from the garrison were missing or had died to causes unrelated to suffocation. There is also the added presence of many non-combatants at the time of the fort's capture that made it difficult to establish an accurate casualty count. Well, Holwell, in his account, the one who was there and saw the whole thing, attributed the maltreatment and deadly conditions of the black hole to the lower-ranking Jemadars, who harbored resentment and sought vengeance for the losses they had suffered during the siege. Despite the horrors of the night, both Holwell and historian Stanley Walpert agreed that Suraj ad Daula never ordered the imprisonment, nor was he made aware of it until after the fact. Yeah. So, from here, we're going to read the entire account from Holwell, and then we're going to get onto a different account, which sort of tells it a little bit differently. One from Robert Orme. So, first, the account of Holwell. The dungeon was a strongly barred room, and it was not intended for the confinement of more than two or three men at a time. There were only two windows, and a projecting veranda outside, and thick iron bars within impeded the ventilation, while fires, raging in different parts of the fort, suggested an atmosphere of further oppressiveness. The prisoners were packed so tightly that the door was difficult to close. One of the soldiers stationed in the veranda was offered 1,000 rupees to have them removed to a larger room. He went away, but returned, saying that it was impossible. The bribe was then doubled, and he made a second attempt with a like result. The Nawab was asleep, and nobody dared wake him. By nine o'clock, several had died and many more were delirious. A frantic cry for water now became general, and one of the guards, more compassionate than his fellows, caused some water to be brought through the bars, where Mr. Holwell and two or three others received it in their hats and passed it on to the men behind them. In their impatience to secure it, nearly all was spilled, and the little they drank seemed only to increase their thirst. Self-control was soon lost. Those in remote parts of the room struggled to reach the window, and a fearful tumult ensued, in which the weakest were trampled or pressed. 
They raved, fought, prayed, blasphemed, and many then fell exhausted on the floor, where suffocation put an end to their torments. About eleven o'clock, the prisoners began to drop off, fast. At length, at six in the morning, Siraj Ud Daula woke and ordered the door to be opened. Of the 146, only 23, including Mr. Holwell, from whose narrative published in the Annual Register and the Gentleman's Magazine for 1758, this account is partly derived, remained alive. And they were either stupefied or raving. Fresh air soon revived them, and the commander was then taken before the Nawab, who expressed no regret for what had occurred, and gave no other sign of sympathy than ordering the Englishman a chair and a glass of water. Notwithstanding this indifference, Mr. Holwell and some others acquit him of any intention of causing the catastrophe, and ascribe it to the malice of certain officers. But many think this opinion unfounded. End of the account. Then next we have the account from Robert Orme, wrote from London in 1778, recalling the events of 1756. The principal officer commanded the prisoners to go into the room of which stood behind them along the veranda. This was the common dungeon of the garrison, who used to call it the Black Hole. Many of the prisoners, knowing their place, began to expostulate, upon which the officer ordered his men to cut down those who hesitated, on which the prisoners obeyed. But before all were within, the room was so thronged that the last entered with difficulty. The guard immediately closed and locked the door, confining 146 persons in a room not twenty feet square, with only small windows, and these obstructed by the veranda. It was the hottest season of the year, and the night uncommonly sultry, even at this season. The excessive pressure of their bodies against one another, and the intolerable heat which prevailed as soon as the door was shut, convinced the prisoners that it was impossible to live through the night in this hostile environment. Violent attempts were immediately made to open the door, but without effect, for it opened inward, on which many began to give vent to rage. Mr. Holwell, who had placed himself at one of the two windows, exhorted them to remain composed both in body and mind, as the only means of surviving the night. His remonstrances produced a short interval of quiet, during which he applied to an old Jamatuda, who bore some marks of humanity in his countenance, promising to give him a thousand rupees in the morning if he would separate the prisoners into two chambers. The old man went to try, but returning in a few minutes, said that it was impossible. Mr. Holwell offered him a larger sum, on which he retired once more, and returned with the fatal sentence, that no relief could be expected, because the nabob was asleep, and not one dared to wake him. In the meantime, every minute had increased their suffering. The first effect of their confinement was a profuse and continued sweat, which soon produced intolerable thirst, succeeded by excruciating pains in the breast, with difficulty breathing, little short of suffocation. Various means were tried to obtain more room and more air, Everybody stripped off his clothes. Every hat was put into motion. And of these methods, affording no relief, 
it was proposed that they should all sit down on their hams for some time, and after remaining a little while in this posture, rise all together. This fatal expedient was thrice repeated, before they had been confined an hour, and every time several, unable to rear themselves up again, fell and were trampled to death by their companions. Attempts were again made to force the door, which, failing as before, redoubled their rage. But the thirst increasing, nothing but water, water, became soon after the general cry. The good Jamadar immediately ordered some skins of waters to be brought to the windows, but instead of relief, his benevolence became a more dreadful cause of destruction, for the fight for the water threw every one into such excessive agitation and ravings that unable to resist this violent impulse of nature, none would wait to be regularly served, but each with the utmost ferocity battled against those who were likely to get it before him. In these conflicts, many were either pressed to death by the efforts of others, or suffocated by their own. This scene, instead of producing compassion in the guard without, only excited their mirth. They held up their light to the bars, in order to have the diabolical satisfaction of seeing the deplorable contentions of the sufferers within, who, finding it impossible to get any water while it was thus furiously disputed, at length suffered those who were nearest to the windows to convey it in their hats to those behind them. It proved no relief, even to their thirst or their other sufferings, for the fever increased every moment with the increasing depravity of the air in the dungeon, which had been so often respired, and was saturated with the hot and deleterious effluvia of putrefying bodies, of which the stench was little less than mortal. Before midnight fell, all who were alive had not partaken of the air at the windows, were either lethargic in stupefaction or raving with delirium. Every kind of invective and abuse was uttered in hope of provoking the guard to put an end to their miseries by firing into the dungeon. And whilst some were blaspheming the Creator with frantic execrations of torment and despair, heaven was implored by others with wild and incoherent prayers, until the weaker, exhausted by these agitations, at length lay down quietly, and expired on the bodies of their dead or agonizing friends. Those who still survived in the inward part of the dungeon, finding that the water had afforded them no relief, made a last effort to obtain air, by endeavouring to scramble over the heads of those who stood between them and the windows, with the utmost strength of every one was employed for two hours, either in maintaining his own ground, or in endeavouring to get that of which others were in possession. All regards of compassion and affection were lost, and no one would recede or give way for the relief of another. Faintness sometimes gave short pauses of quiet, but the first motion of any one renewed the struggle through all, under whichever and anon some one sunk to rise no more. At two o'clock not more than fifty remained alive, but even this number were too many to partake of the saving of air the contest for which and for life continued until the morning, long implored, began to break, and with the hope of relief gave the few survivors a view of the dead. The survivors then at the window, 
Finding the entreaties could not prevail on the guard to open the door, it occurred to Mr. Cook, the secretary of the council, that Mr. Holwell, if alive, might have more influence to obtain their relief, and two of the company, undertaking to search, discovered him, having still some signs of life. But when they brought him towards the window, everyone refused to quit his place, excepting Captain Mills, who with rare generosity offered to resign his, on which the rest likewise agreed to make room. He had scarcely begun to recover his senses, before an officer, sent by the Nabob himself, came and inquired if the English chief still survived, and soon after the same man returned with an order to open the prison. The dead were so thronged, and the survivors had so little strength remaining, that they were employed near half an hour in removing the bodies which lay against the door, before they could clear a passage to go out one at a time. When one of the hundred and forty-six who went in no more than twenty-three came out alive, the ghastliest forms that were ever seen. The Nabob's troops beheld them, and the havoc of death from which they had escaped, with indifference, but did not prevent them from removing to a distance, and were immediately obliged by the intolerable stench to clear the dungeon, whilst others dug a ditch on the outside of the fort, into which all the dead bodies were promiscuously thrown. Mr. Holwell, unable to stand, was soon carried to the Nabob, who was so far from showing any compassion for his condition, or remorse for the death of the other prisoners, that he only talked of the treasures which the English had buried, threatening him with further injuries if he persisted in concealing them. He ordered him to be kept a prisoner. The officers, who, to whose charge he was delivered, put him into fetters. The rest of the survivors were told that they might go where they pleased, but an English woman, the only one among them, was reserved for the seraglio of the general Meet Jaffier. The dread of the remaining any longer within the search of such barbarians determined most of them to remove immediately as so far as their strength enabled them from the ford, and most tended towards the vessels which were still in the fight. A single sloop, with fifteen brave men on board, might, in spite of their efforts of the enemy, have come up, and anchoring under the ford, have carried away all who suffered within the dungeon. And thus the end of the account of Robert Orme, writing in 1778 from London. Eee, sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Does not sound like a pleasant place to be. Well, of course, in memory to the victims, the British erected a 15-metre obelisk, and it still stands today in St. John's Anglican Church in Kolkata. Shortly after the incident... John Zephaniah Horwell had originally installed a tablet at the site of the Black Hall to honour those that perished, but at some point the memorial disappeared, and to this day we don't know where it's gone. But in 1899, Lord Curzon, upon becoming Viceroy of India, noticed the absence of a memorial, and he took steps to rectify it. He acknowledged Horwell's earlier tribute, and commissioned a new monument, completed in 1901, and placed at the corner of Dalhousie Square, which is now the Caldy BBD Bog. I believe that's what I looked it up as, at least. Well, that is the supposed location of the original Black Hole. Although it looks quite different, it still looks rather unpleasant if you look at the pictures. Now, as the Indian independence movement gained momentum, the presence of the British monument in Calcutta 
became a contentious issue, even though it was a memorial. Now, there were prominent nationalist leaders who vigorously called for its removal, as it was viewed as a symbol of British colonial oppression. After all, the British weren't putting up memorials to the Indians who died, weren't they? I suppose you can look at it that way. Either way, it's a memorial, though. We shouldn't be taking memorials down. Well, leaders from both the Congress Party and the Muslim League actually united in their opposition to the monument. So, in July 1940, led by student activist Abdul Wasek Mir, the monument was finally removed from Dalhousie Square and then relocated to the current location of St. John's Anglican Church. Now, as for the original black hole itself, which was once the guard room of the old Fort William, well, that vanished when the fort was dismantled to make way for the construction of the new Fort William, located in the Maidan to the south of BBD Varg. The former site of the guard room is now actually an alley between the general post office and a nearby building in the northwest corner of Varg. There was a commemorative tablet that once marked the location of the black hole, but that's been moved since to the Postal Museum. So I'm afraid there's not much to see. But of course, there are two sides to every story. And there's equally an argument that exists to the extent of the tragedy, particularly in form of criticism towards Holwell's account. Now, Holwell depicted that harrowing scene in which the asphyxiating prisoner, asphyxiated prisoners rather frantically sought for air to the dungeon's two minuscule windows, which by the morning only 23 of them were alive. Now, this has been questioned a little bit. Of course, this account certainly incited intense outrage in Britain, which we'll get to in a moment, and also exacerbated anti-Indian sentiments. And when sentiments are that exacerbated, well, you can sort of use it to get away with anything, can't you? Nonetheless, the authenticity of Homo's account has been increasingly scrutinized over time. Numerous historians have contested the specifics, proposing that the account was amplified to strengthen British determination and rationalize the very harsh measures on India. In 1915, historian J. H. Little expressed reservations regarding Holwell's credibility as a witness, highlighting discrepancies in his account and implying that Holwell might have exaggerated his involvement to depict himself as a hero. Well, the Indian historian Brijan Gupta in the 1950s presented another alternative account of the events. Now, he contended that the prisoner count was probably nowhere near the original count of 146. He thought it was rather about 64, with 21 of them enduring the night. Now, Gupta presented evidence including that the Nawab of Bengal neither authorized the imprisonment, nor was even cognizant of the fatalities until subsequent to their occurrence. The ambiguity regarding the specific details of the black hole does not significantly reduce its symbolic significance, however. Although the figures are contested, with estimates ranging from 64 to 146, it's still pretty terrible, no matter which way you look at it. And narrowing it down to 64 does not make the situation any less horrifying. Well, we already know how terrible it all is, but what happened next? Well, it's not like everybody just went home and forgot about it, right? Regardless of the exact number, this was not just some lost battle. This was an injury of British pride. This was barbaric. When news of the tragedy reached Britain in early six, 1757, it ignited this firestorm of shock, anger, and of course demands for retribution. 
The primary catalyst for this reaction was John Zephaniah Holwell's account, which he published promptly upon his return to England. While the British public, who were already harbouring anxieties about their nation's global standing and the security of its overseas interests, were deeply moved by Holwell's story, which also gave this account of the Nawab of Bengal's this cruel and tyrannical figure, a kind of nightmare-like creature coming to punish the Brits. And we can't have that scary monster. Mm. Well, newspapers, pamphlets, and broadsheets disseminating his account widely often embellished the details to heighten the sense of outrage. This incident was framed not just as a tragic loss of life, but a moral atrocity, a crime against God himself, the worst thing ever. <laughs> you got to sell the newspapers, don't you? Especially when it's committed against innocent Britons by a barbaric foreign ruler. Well, it tapped into and reinforced these existing stereotypes of Eastern despotism and cruelty, and public support was more or less galvanized for decisive action. Parliamentarians and influential figures within the British East India Company seized upon public sentiment to advocate for stronger military and political presence in India. The company's trading operations had already been suffering at this time due to competition with the French and the unstable political climate in Bengal. The Black Hole incident provided both the impetus and the moral justification for the company to take more aggressive measures to secure its interests. In response, the East India Company organized a military expedition to Bengal, appointing Robert Clive, a seasoned officer, known for his previous successes in southern India, to lead the campaign. Clive arrived in Madras, which is now modern-day Chennai, around mid-1756, and upon learning of the fall of Calcutta and the Black Hole tragedy, swiftly prepared a force to retake the city. By December of the same year, 1756, Clive had assembled a contingent of around 2,500 soldiers, including both British regulars and Indian sepoys who were employed by the company. Remember, they were getting their own mercenaries to the East India Company. Now, Clive's forces landed near Calcutta in January 1757 and quickly recaptured the city with minimal resistance as Siraj ud Daula had not anticipated a British response, or at least not one so rapidly. However, Clive's ambitions extended beyond merely retaking Calcutta. You see, he recognised an opportunity to significantly expand British influence in Bengal. Strike while the iron is hot. You know how it is. Want to achieve this, he engaged in a series of clandestine negotiations with the discontented Bengali nobles and commanders, who were reportedly quite unsatisfied with the Nawab Siraj ud Dwala's rule. Now central to these machinations was Mir Jafar, the commander-in-chief of the Nawab's army. Clive and his agents promised him the throne of Bengal, in exchange for his support in overthrowing the Nawab. This conspiracy laid the groundwork for the decisive confrontation at the Battle of Plassey on June the 23rd, 1757. At Plassey, Clive's forces faced the Nawab's army, which was significantly larger, numbering around 50,000 troops compared to Clive's 3,000. However, due to Prior arrangements, Mir Jafar and a substantial portion of the Nawab's army actually refrained from engaging in the battle. When the time came, weapons went down and 
shoulders were shrugged. Nobody was going to take up arms against the Brits. Well, this act of betrayal left the Nawab's forces demoralised and disorganised. Clive capitalised on the chaos, and his well-trained troops routed the remaining forces. Now, the victory of Plassey was not just a military triumph, but it was the pivotal moment that marked the beginning of British colonial dominance in India. Following the battle, Mir Jafar was installed as the new Nawab of Bengal, and he was largely a puppet ruler. Of course he was. Under the thumb of the East India Company, you do as you're told. The company gained control over Bengal's vast revenues and resources, which significantly enhanced its financial and political power. Now, back in Britain, news of Clive's success and the avenging of the Black Hole tragedy was met with widespread acclaim. Clive? Well, he was hailed as a national hero, and the East M- East India Company, rather, well, their stock price soared. The investors were happy with that, I'm sure. The narrative of British bravery and moral righteousness overcoming the Eastern treachery reinforced the public's support for even more imperial expansion. The company's shareholders and British politicians alike saw the potential for immense wealth and strategic advantage in extending British control over Indian territories. Well, all in all, the Black Hole incident and the subsequent British actions also had lasting impacts on British-Indian relations. India would never be the same either. Neither would Britain. Colonialism was about to change. The event was enshrined in British culture as a symbol of barbarism and the supposed civilizing mission of British colonialism. It justified in many of the eyes of the Brits the expansion of their empire as a force for order and progress in a land betrayed as rife with cruelty and despotism. So over the following decades, the East India Company continued to consolidate its power, using a combination of military force, political manipulation, and economic control. The Regulating Act of 1773 and the India Act of 1784 further solidified British government oversight of the company's activities, effectively integrating its Indian territories into the British Empire. But that is a complicated tale for another day. I think we've talked enough about the Black Hole of Calcutta, the befores, the afters, the what-ifs, and the maybes. But it's exactly as I said before. Now, sometimes with these sorts of tragedies, you have people who are on certain sides of politics who want to shrug shoulders and say, well, they shouldn't have been there, so their suffering is somehow justified. No, that's not right to say that. It doesn't matter. A human suffering is a human suffering, no matter where they are or what circumstance it is. It's never good. The suffering of somebody else shouldn't make somebody else happy. A little off topic, but you know, I have to say these sorts of things. Sometimes with these videos, you get people saying, well, they deserved it because of this and that. No, we're not going to go down that road. Which is not. But what we are going to do is thank the patrons and supporters. That's what we're going to do. So we got Dark, Gary, Kimberly, Ember, Britt, Charles, Aaron, James, Jeffrey, Melissa, Scott, Stark Factory, Wendy, Jaden, Sherry, Jessica, Christine, Sally, Katiana, Christine, Legitmus, Zabo, Maverick, Susan, Dr. Neuro Nerd, a real doctor, I assume, Cameron, Alexander, Nicholas, and Daniel. Thank you very much for your support, as always. And I will see you 
in the very next video, if you feel inclined to join me again. Best wishes to you all. Lots of love to you all, and good night.